Join us tonight on TV 12 Montgomery. From Alabama's News Center, the WSFA TV News 6 o'clock report. Bob Howell with news, Dan Atkinson weather, and Phil Snow sports. Good evening. It's being called the worst fire in the history of the city. It began in the pre-dawn hours in Huntsville, Alabama, when an aging industrial complex caught fire. News director Skip Haley has more on the building fire in that North Alabama city. At times today, smoke rose above Huntsville in a 900-foot column as the complex burned. The fire was first reported about 4.30 this morning. It burned for more than 12 hours. Times during the day, there were minor explosions inside the building, and firemen quickly evacuated a 10-block area, fearing that larger explosions would follow. They didn't. The 750,000-square-foot complex was part of an area of downtown Huntsville that for years was the heart of the city's cotton industry. It was built around the turn of the century. The age of the Hick building will cause some real grief for some of its tenants. Because it was so old, there was no insurance included in the lease. Two tenants talked about their business with Huntsville's Channel 19. It's in the back rear of the building, uh, the northeast corner, and uh, we were back on that side a few minutes ago, and it looks like it's burning, but it hasn't reached mine yet, but I ha have no hopes of keeping anything. You're working at the same place? Yeah, we work at, uh, for World Media Graphics, and we have a, a whole lot of graphic supplies in there and a whole lot of our own things stored in there. And, of course, there's no insurance on it because we didn't have any insurance of our own. And uh, in our lease, of course, it said that, you know, uh, Huntsville no Industrial Center, you know, has no, you know, fire or theft damage. Uh, One of the reasons for the massive evacuation and the closing of two Huntsville schools, Lehigh School and Lincoln Middle School, was chemicals stored inside the building. Police Chief Sal Vazzini says propane, chlorine, and 700 gallons of charcoal lighter fluid were inside the burning Hick building. But miraculously, the feared big blasts never came, and no serious injuries have been reported. All told, there were about 60 businesses in the complex, and the damage is going to run well into the millions. Skip Haley, WSFA TV News. Tonight, the fire is about to burn itself out, and first efforts are being made to get into the area to determine what caused the fire. Here in Montgomery today, firemen were called to the Macedonia community just south of the bypass to a house fire. A Montgomery fire official says the firefighting efforts were hampered slightly by a lack of water in the immediate area. So a tanker was brought in to help the two pumpers fight the blaze. According to fire department spokesman, the blaze started under a fireplace and spread into the walls of the house. Damage to the home and its contents was estimated at $9,000. No injuries were reported. The identity of the so-called Columbus Strangler may finally be known. According to Wes Sargentson of WSB-TV in Atlanta, a Georgia death row inmate has been named as the Strangler by other inmates in the prison. The Strangler killed several elderly residents in the Columbus, Georgia area during the year 1978. The story broke while Sargentson, formerly a reporter here in Montgomery, was doing a series of reports on the Georgia prison system. Dave Rickey of our staff has more on the story. This is the fashionable Columbus suburb of Winton, where most of the murders occurred. All of the victims were elderly, wealthy women. All were strangled with a stocking. Sargentson says while he was preparing his prison series, two death row inmates approached him with information about the strangler. They said they were telling him because, in their words, they had nothing to lose. They were going to die anyhow. Sargentson was told the suspect had bragged to other inmates about the Columbus killings. For the security of the informants, the name of the prison where Sargentson was approached is being withheld. Attempts to isolate the inmates have been unsuccessful due to limited prison space. Officials with the Columbus Police Department say they're a little reluctant to be optimistic about the reports. They say the information they have received will be treated the same as all information received in the past. A police spokesman, David Hopkins, did admit someone from his department had visited the prison, but he refused to elaborate. Dave Rickey, WSFA-TV News. 
Jefferson County District Attorney Earl Morgan says that he wants the Justice Department to send him a copy of a report published in the New York Times. He said if that report contains sufficient evidence against three former Ku Klux Klansmen said to be linked to the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church but never indicted, he'll ask for their prosecution. The report was part of a Justice Department investigation of former FBI informant Gary Thomas Rawl. That same report was critical of the late J. Edgar Hoover, former director of the FBI, saying that on two separate occasions he stopped the prosecution of the 16th Street bombing. Today, former Alabama Attorney General Bill Baxley said that Hoover's getting a bum rap. Baxley, who himself was critical of the FBI's handling of the bombing case while he was in office, said that reporters were reading the Justice Department report wrong, and Baxley says he thinks that Hoover was holding off until he got a confession. Coming up, help being sought for Alabama's Medicaid program and Fred Gray's controversial nomination to a federal judgeship. You know what I love about winter? Ethan Allen's winter sale. Come on, it's happening now. My gallery's a winter wonderland of furniture. What a collection and what savings on things to spruce up my living room, warm up my bedroom, cheer up every room in my house. Hurry over to Ethan Allen's winter sale. Fine furniture and fantastic savings. That's my gallery. Your Ethan Allen dealer, 2001 Eastern Bypass. You know, all the leading pain relievers are tablets, so why does Stanback still make a powder? Well, it's because Stanback is a powder that it works so fast. You see, Stanback is already dissolved when you take it. I simply mix it in water just like instant coffee, and it goes to work fighting pain, even inflammation and fever, fast. But time was, powders were all people took for pain relief. Now tablets are more popular, but when you're suffering from pain, what do you want? You want popularity or fast pain relief? Stanback powders, an idea whose time has come back. There's nothing magic about growing peanuts. In fact, almost anybody can grow peanuts that look like this. <coughs> but growing this kind takes something special. It takes furidan, insecticide, and nematicide. Because first, furidan goes into the ground to get nematodes. Then it goes into the plant to control thrips and aid in control of leafhoppers. So if you want high tonnage, high quality peanuts, don't look for magic. Look for furidan. Governor James and Medical Services Administrator Hulk Kearns were in Washington today meeting with HEW Secretary Patricia Harris. They were trying to find some solutions to the state's Medicaid funding crisis by requesting the waiver of certain federal requirements in the program. James met with Ms. Harris for about 45 minutes and later told reporters that he was told the funding problems are not unique to Alabama. James said that following a two-hour meeting between Ms. Harris, Kearns, and HEW staff members, he was told the HEW you would get back in touch on Thursday. At the same time, Governor James and Hope Kearns were in Washington discussing Alabama's Medicaid crisis. A group of concerned Alabamians was here, meeting in Montgomery, trying to help the Medicaid program in their own way. The Alabama Network to Save the Medicaid Program was formed today by representatives of 17 state organizations. Participants agreed to share information services, technical assistance, and coordinate efforts to save the faltering Medicaid program. The group says 400,000 Alabama citizens will be severely harmed if the state goes ahead with its plan to discontinue optional Medicaid services on April 1st and to discontinue the entire program in June if adequate funding isn't made available. According to Ruben Hannon, president of the Alabama's League of Aging Citizens, the voices of the people can and must make a difference. This fine, honest people do not want your sympathy. They are not beggars and they want rightful theirs, right to live in free society in which they are in work, and we need our Medicare as important to our lives. The network will begin meeting on a regular basis probably every two weeks until, as one member puts it, the whole Medicaid issue is resolved for the good of the people. Sidney Kohara, WSFA TV News. While the governor is in Washington, at least one member of the Alabama legislature, Representative Lee Pegues of Marion, is wondering where the governor's Medicaid bill is. 
According to Pegues, last Tuesday, the administration indicated a bill would be sent up on Thursday to transfer $25 million from the state insurance fund over to Medicaid. Pegues says that's the last contact the administration has had with him. He says the action is, quote, typical of the James administration. He went on and we quote, that's the way it was last year. They mean well, they just can't get their program together, end quote. Pegues says that the governor sent up a similar Medicaid bill earlier and advised uh, the floor leaders in the House, uh, rather the floor leaders in the House had advised the governor to work on the bill some more so it would have a chance of passage. Almost 60% of the faculty members voting at the University of Alabama today have given University President Dr. David Matthews a vote of no confidence. The Faculty Senate sponsored the referendum to gauge faculty support for the Matthews administration. Three options were proposed. Option one, a vote of confidence. It received 126 votes. Option two, calling for more discussion, received 140 votes. And option number three, no confidence, received 400 votes. The Faculty Senate discussed several plans after these votes were tallied. One of the ideas called for a nationally known consultant on university governing to be hired. The Faculty Senate, however, adjourned without taking any action. So far, there's been no reaction from the university's administration. Today, a Birmingham newspaper published an editorial suggesting that Tuskegee attorney Fred Gray withdraw from consideration as a federal judge. This is only the latest in a series of news reports concerning Gray's qualification for the bench. Tonight, reporter Norman Lumpkin has an analysis of Gray's nomination. The nomination of Fred Gray as a federal judge seems to produce new allegations of misconduct by the civil rights attorney every day but he hasn't withdrawn from consideration by the Senate Judiciary Committee, nor will he give interviews to discuss the situation. Investigative reporter teams from national as well as Alabama papers are sifting through every case he's tried. The senators on the Judiciary Committee haven't made any public moves to remove the nominee. President Carter is still sticking with Gray, and Joe Reed, the man who pushed for appointment of blacks to the federal bench, told me today how he feels about what's going on. I would say that uh, nothing has been written about the white nominees. In fact, many folks don't even know there are three white judges to be appointed also at this time. And uh, also that oh, there's been implications and allegations that uh, uh, blacks uh, or some deal made. Uh, when blacks are, are recommended, uh, they call it a deal. When whites are recommended, they call it democracy. I think it's all because of the fact that many folks don't want to see any black men serving as federal judges in this state. At this point, there seems to be no budging by the National Bar Association in its opposition to Gray's appointment. And Gray is still waiting to testify in Washington, while reporters continue to dig through files in county courthouses throughout the state in search of cases tried by federal district judge nominee Fred Gray of Tuskegee. Bob? Thanks, Norman. District Attorney Jimmy Evans now says that his probe of the Alabama Public Service Commission is not focusing on three persons whose bank records were subpoenaed in connection with the investigation. Evans' comment was contrary to earlier reports which said that PSE attorney Carl Evans, staff member Jim Williams, and former Commissioner Jim Ziegler were probe targets. A jury in Birmingham is still deliberating the alleged kickback trial of Limestone County Commissioner Dave Davis and former Commissioners Terry Bottom and Elon Hamilton. It's the latest in a series of cases involving what are uh, described as being cash kickbacks from uh, Tennessee contractor Paul Baldwin. Eastern Airlines today did not file a petition with the Civil Aeronautics Board notifying that agency of its intention to suspend flight service to Montgomery. Michael Jones tells us more about what would happen when and if the petition is filed. Eastern Flight 508, departing Danley Field, bound for Atlanta. This is one of three Eastern flights daily to Atlanta that will end June 1st when Eastern suspends its Montgomery route. That will leave Alabama's capital city with two airlines, Delta and Republic. Will there be enough air service to Montgomery without Eastern? Delta's Montgomery manager says while his airline is not planning to add more flights, it probably will use larger planes. But Gil Malik says even now they can handle more passengers. Right now we have over 550 seats available per day out of here and we're only using uh, 
approximately 350 of them. So that leaves 200 empty seats a day uh, that we can accommodate that many more passengers. Malik says it's doubtful a commuter airline will set up service in Montgomery. Tomorrow morning at 11, Eastern Airlines officials will meet with Mayor Fulmer, members of the Montgomery Airport Authority, and the Chamber of Commerce. Immediately following the meeting, Eastern is expected to announce the suspension of its Montgomery service. Michael Jones, WSFA-TV News, Danley Field. We all have someone who depends on us. And when you've got a family to protect, it's natural to want to give them as much help as you can. That's why at Cotton States, we offer complete life insurance coverage that will make sure your family gets all the protection they need. At Cotton States, we do a lot more than just sell you insurance. We help you keep your family together. See the yellow pages for your nearest Cotton States agent. Showboat, America's greatest musical starring Boris Tucker with Butterfly McQueen. Showboat makes the splendor, drama, and pageantry of a bygone era come alive again. Life on the Mississippi unfolds through the unforgettably beautiful Jerome Kern Oscar Hammerstein score. Showboat Live, a once-in-a-lifetime experience for the entire family. Coming to the Montgomery Civic Center, Sunday, February 24th. Get your tickets now. Tonight, some shop talk involving our own broadcasting family. Our parent firm, Cosmos Broadcasting, has announced that our general manager, Dixon Lovern, is being transferred to our sister station, WDSU, in New Orleans. Cosmos President Law Epps praised Mr. Lovern's management abilities in his 26 years with the corporation. A replacement for Mr. Lovern has not been named, but the move to New Orleans will take place at the end of next month. And on a slightly editorial note, we don't know who our new boss will be, but he's got some pretty big shoes to fill following Dixon Lover. Boss, we're going to miss you. Well, Dan, uh, what's the weather going to do in the next couple of days? Well, I'm afraid to say. We said today should be partly <laughs> cloudy. <laughs> That's the reason I asked that question. The rain was unexpected. It moved in from the west rapidly. It developed over the lower Mississippi Valley, Bob, and moved right on across Alabama. Still here, but it's moved on into Georgia now. It's probably not going to get into the southernmost counties. That's been the case during the day, and it will probably remain the case during the night. Rain over the central and northern sections of the state with the rain ending early tomorrow. And uh, probably mostly cloudy skies for the state tomorrow, but rain returning, showers likely by Thursday. We are continuing to have a warm-up. After uh, readings yesterday morning in the teens and 20s, this morning we had temperatures in the 30s and 40s. And during the afternoon, with a lot of clouds covering the state, temperatures ranged from 40s in the north to 60s down south. We're under the influence of warm, moist air flowing up off the Gulf of Mexico. As I said a moment ago, there were some showers and thunder showers which developed earlier in the day in the lower Mississippi Valley, then moved eastward. The temperatures which you see on the national map indicate the range of readings across the U.S. at 1 o'clock Central Time. At that hour, the warmest city was Corpus Christi, Texas, with 82. The coolest spot, or the coldest spot in the nation, uh, Fargo, North Dakota, or Devil's Lake, North Dakota, I should say, with 9 degrees. Here's today's satellite picture of the nation's weather, stormy weather continues to plague the west coast. Rain is scattered throughout California with snow in the higher elevations of the Sierras. Mount Wilson, east of Los Angeles, has had three inches of rain since yesterday afternoon. California's coastal cities have had winds of 30 to rather 25 to 30 miles per hour today. Uh, there have been some uh, few showers in Oregon and the Intermountain region. It's been quite windy in Colorado. The eastern foothills of that state have uh, been reporting wind gusts up to 85 miles per hour from the southwest. Uh, some light snow was scattered over North Dakota and parts of Montana. A few snow showers lingered in the Great Lakes region. And here in the southeast, the showers and thunder showers moving eastward across our part of the country with some light rain scattered along the east coast of Florida. Here's a look at TV-12's color radar, scanning now from Montgomery, indicating rain in northern and central sections of the state, mainly in the eastern half of Alabama. A light to moderate rain extending from Eufaula and Troy, right on up through Auburn, Montgomery, uh, Alex City, Clanton, on up to Birmingham and Anniston. Precipitation is moving to the east at about 40 miles per hour. Some 6 o'clock temperatures, Birmingham reports 46 degrees, 48 in Tuscaloosa, 52 in Alex City, 55 in Auburn, Opelika. It's 58 degrees in Union Springs, 61 
51 in Ozark, Enterprise 59, 55 in Greenville, and 60 in Mobile. At Montgomery's Danley Field, light rain, the temperature 13 Celsius or 55 Fahrenheit. Our low this morning, 34, today's high, 63. Winds are from the southwest at 4 miles per hour, relative humidity 69%. The barometer rising at 29.94, and we had had no rain as of 5 o'clock at the airport. At 7 this morning, the level of Lake Martin was down by one-tenth of a foot from yesterday at the same hour. Lake Jordan's level unchanged. Sunrise Wednesday, 624, with the sun setting at 536. The forecast for tonight, cloudy with a 40% chance of rain. Southeasterly winds with a low in the upper 40s. Wednesday and Wednesday night, mostly cloudy and warmer. High tomorrow in the upper 60s, the low tomorrow night in the lower 50s. And Thursday, still mostly cloudy and warmer with showers likely. The high that day in the low 70s. That's it, Bob. Thanks, Dan. When we come back, story on a rash of pet poisonings over in Opelika. Whoa! This is your home speedometer. And like your car, the faster it goes, the more energy you burn. Alabama Power's free kit shows you how to make an energy budget and stick to it. With tips on what to do, and what not to do. Lots of ways to slow down and get the most mileage out of your energy dollar. So get the kit, free from any Alabama power offer. I thought it would take years to own a home. But we got the facts and all the help we needed from Louder Realty and Better Homes and Gardens. Louder makes it easy. Love makes it home. Louder Realty and Better Homes and Gardens. Some Opelika, Alabama residents are at odds with the Opelika Board of Commissioners over an apparent problem of dog poisoning. Alicia McLeod and nearly a dozen other Opelika residents are very upset over the apparent strychnine poisoning of house pets over the last several years. Ms. McLeod says many pets just mysteriously disappear and later are found dead. Four years ago, these pictures were taken of some dead animals, only some of a dozen or so found dead that day due to apparent poisoning. Opelika Mayor D.B. Jones told me in an interview this morning he speculated some farmers could have been putting out poisonous hot dogs to ward off what he called packs of dogs who kill calves and cause other damage. Ms. McLeod agrees with the hypothesis. In bringing their arguments to City Hall, the citizens group found two problems. First, Alabama state law doesn't prohibit someone from putting poison out on their property under certain conditions. And second, the city of Opelika has no city ordinance protecting against these type animal poisonings. We're concerned that our children are going to be poisoned. Uh, in fact, we're, uh, I feel relatively lucky so far that they haven't already been. And Ms. McLeod's group presented the commissioners with a petition this afternoon that asked for an ordinance prohibiting any type of animal poisonings within city limits. But Commissioner Stanley Drake thinks such an ordinance is premature for the problem. It's my hope that once both sides, if we can call them sides, understand the problems and the concerns of the other, that some amiable reconciliation of this matter can be had. Ms. McLeod accuses the commission of looking lightly on what she calls a potentially dangerous situation. Ms. McLeod says if her group fails with the Opelika City Commission, then they'll try for changes in the state law governing the use of poisons. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News, Opelika. Well, you know, Philip with uh, Dixon Lovern going down to be general manager down at WDSU, at least he's going to get a chance to enjoy some of the good Creole cooking down that way. Maybe we can get some tickets to the Sugar Bowl, too. We'll, we'll try, I'm okay. sure. What's happening in sports in the well, Olympics? American speed skater Eric Hyden is still on course for those five gold medals. He won the 1,000-meter race today, again in record time. That's three out of three now. Olympic history waits if he can win the 1,500 meters on Thursday and then somehow come back for the grueling 10,000 meters on Saturday. He talked to newsmen after today's victory. I think the biggest margin I've ever won 1,000 by is, must be about two seconds or a little bit more, I'm not really sure. Uh, for me, the race went pretty well. I stumbled a little bit on the last back stretch because I kicked myself in the back of the heel. Uh, otherwise, it went pretty well. Yeah, it looked like it was pretty windy, but once I got started, I didn't really notice it at all. Yeah, there's still, there's two races to go. Um, 10,000 meter will be the last race. There's a lot of uh, 
skaters that I haven't skated big competitions against in the 10,000, and so we'll just have to see what happens. Hopefully I'll be, you know, mentally prepared. I think physically things are going pretty well. It's getting harder and harder, though, to get prepared for each race. Elsewhere at Lake Placid today, the Americans were shut out in the giant slalom. As expected, Ingemar Stenmark of Sweden was the winner there. America's hopes for a gold in the men's figure skating stumbled a bit. Charlie Tickner, who had trouble in the short program today, slipped from second to third. David Santi of the U.S. fell to fourth. Uh, with the important five-minute program, the long program, coming up on Thursday to wind that up. Walter Malquis of the U.S. did poorly in the cross-country part of the Nordic combined event today. He ended up 12th. He was second going in after the ski jump. The East Germans continue to pile up the gold. Three more today. If Jim Colbert was a horse, they'd call him a mutter. After a five-year drought, no pun intended, Colbert rolled to a four-shot victory in the Tucson Open today. It took till today to play the rain-delayed $300,000 tournament, and through it all, Colbert, despite some back problems, kept putting low numbers on the board, sinking putts like that. At one point in today's round, he was leading by seven and needed only two more birdies to break Johnny Miller's record for 72 holes at Tucson. However, bogeys at 12 and 14 ruined his record hopes. He settled in for a four-shot win over hard-charging Dan Halderson with a 72-hole card of 270. That's 22 under par. Even though it was wet, most of the tournament conditions for scoring remained good, and Colbert's putter left him only on the final nine. His last win was in 1974. The Alabama State Hornets are still the number one team in the NAIA poll, padding their lead this week by picking up all but two first place ballots, 29 of the 31. Now they need only one more victory tonight to guarantee their position atop the national polls and into the national tournament at Kansas City. They play Stillman tonight in Tuscaloosa. Pairings were made for the Southern States Conference Tournament today. That tournament begins Thursday at AUM. The Senators, the uh, homestanding Senators, play a first-round game at 8.30 Thursday night. They must win the tournament to make the District 27 playoffs. DePaul hopes, uh, DePaul's hopes of an unbeaten season are growing day by day now. The Blue Demons are now 23-0 and, and naturally ranked number one again this week in the Associated Press poll, getting all the first-place votes as usual. Louisville moved to number two. Kentucky up to third, Syracuse slipped from second to fourth, and LSU moved into the top five. Then it's Oregon State, St. John's of New York, North Carolina, Maryland is ninth, and Notre Dame back in the top ten in the number ten spot. Second ten, Ohio State, Clemson, Missouri, 13th, Brigham Young, Purdue, Weber State, Duke, Arizona State, Indiana, and Washington, 20th. The Floyd Junior High Falcons are just one victory away from a perfect season now, and the State Junior High School Basketball Championship. The Falcons, though one of the smaller schools in town, have that rare blend of talent and cohesiveness that wins basketball games. They are now 25-0, the last seven wins in tournament competition that has carried them to the junior high championship game this Saturday night on their home court. Their big man in the middle is Marvin Humphreys, a 6'2 all-around athlete averaging 21 points a game, MVP in the county and area tournaments. Redigo Long averages 18 points a game, an all-tournament player, too. Rick Yates, 15 points a game, a very steady player and also an all-star. Kenny Smith scores 12 points a game, but is valuable in the Falcons' pressing game with his quickness. Marquette Shepard is the point man who shares playing time with Ken McKissick. Coach Stan Edwards describes his team's style of play. Well, primarily, we're a fast break team. We like to press and uh, uh, try to capitalize on the press and get the ball off the board on the fast break. Who are the guys who are the keys in the press play? Well, of course, Marvin Humphreys is our leading rebounder. He's averaging about 15 rebounds a game. And uh, Rick Yates and Ready to Go Long, Kenny Smith, uh, I'll help out with our rebound. These guys look very coachable. They look like they're a pleasure to work with. Well, like I've told everybody, it, uh, talent does help, and we've got a good, good group of boys this year. And that championship game will be played at Floyd uh, Saturday night, 7.30. They've been very fortunate to play most of the tournament in their gym. We'll be back with Alabama Mardi Gras. Big Bear and Superfoods want you to know all about high-top quality. 
High Top buyers search the country and the world for top quality foods. The only kind of foods that go inside the High Top package. High Top stands for quality in dairy products, in bakery treats, and in canned goods. If your taste runs to fine foods, you should taste High Top. Superfoods at super prices every day at Superfoods and Big Bear. We were working the Katie mine that day when we saw him standing in the entrance way. He was a tobacco chewing workhorse, a man, yes he was. And his chew was the longer lasting workhorse brand. The longer lasting flavor of workhorse keeps on coming through so a man can keep on doing what he's got to do. He was a tobacco chewing workhorse of a man, yes he was. And his chew was the longer lasting workhorse brand. Finally tonight, lots of people from around the world have congregated down in Mobile, Alabama and in New Orleans, Louisiana for the celebration of Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday. In Mobile, thousands jammed to the city streets. In New Orleans, literally hundreds of thousands of people will end the two-week Mardi Gras celebration. And here in Montgomery, a city that used to have a Mardi, Gras, a Mardi Gras parade, a masked ball will be our city's celebration tonight. We'll have more on that tonight at 10. Until then, thanks for watching. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Brought to you by Mutual of Omaha. People you can count on. Starring Marlon Perkins. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of the most unusual sounds I've heard in nature is one I heard recently while diving in the ocean. Listen. That's the strange voice, as we recorded it in last week's show, of the humpback whale. This marine mammal reaches a length of 57 feet and...